Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the 28th online Spintronics seminar. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, Xin Fan from University of Denver. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Professor Marcos Guimaraes received his PhD degree in 2015 from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands. Uh, after that, he moved to Cornell University where he worked with uh, Professor Dan Ralph, uh, Professor G. Wong Park, and uh, Professor Paul uh, McQueen on spin orbit talk using 2D materials, among other things. In 2017, Marcos returned to the Netherlands to work on ultra-fast optics in 2D materials at the Eindhoven University of Technology with Professor Bert Koopmans. In February 2019, he joined the uh, Zerniker Institute for Advanced Materials at the University of Groningen as the assistant professor. His research focuses on the magnetic and spintronic properties of 2D materials and the metallic thin films studied by the magneto optical and uh, electrical means. So without further ado, Marcos, please take it from here. Thanks, Simpen. I uh, would first like to, uh, to thank for the, for the invitation to, uh, to participate on this uh, online colloquium. I think it's a, a great initiative. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, yeah, a little bit of uh, the, the, yeah, when I started doing a spin orbit work using 2D, uh, 2D materials and uh, some recent works that we have uh, right now. Uh, the, the works uh, were done together with the, these collaborators at Cornell, uh, especially in the group of uh, Professor Dan Ralph. Uh, and uh, uh, we work uh, closely together with uh, uh, Dave McNeil, uh, that's now at MIT. Uh, and uh, Greg Steele. Uh, and uh, then when I moved to Eindhoven, I continue uh, doing the uh, spin orbit work uh, experiments in the group of uh, Professor Beat Koopmans and Hank Zwarte uh, and working together with a PhD student there uh, called Cassis Schippers. Um, well, just uh, just an outline of the talk. Uh, I will give a brief introduction to spin orbit works, even though uh, there were uh, quite a few related talks uh, on that already. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll do my take on it, and also to for the the talk to be uh, self-contained. Uh, but if you want to know more about uh, spin orbit works, uh, check uh, well these videos and others. Uh, then I'll move on to actual results in uh, layered materials and specifically on tungsten ditellurite, uh, niobium diselenite, and the recent results that we have on a, a 2D antiferromagnet, uh, uh, which is a nickel thiophosphate. Uh, and uh, there were also related talks on spintronics using 2D materials here. Uh, so uh, it's also uh, a nice, very nice talks uh, that on, uh, on 2D materials, uh, spintronics before me. Well, spin-basic electronics, uh, I, I don't have to, uh, to pitch here because I think you all like that, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, uh, there, there is this, uh, this uh, RAM memory, magnetic RAM memory from, uh, from Everspin, uh, which is based in spin transfer torque. Uh, where the building block is basically a uh, magnetic tunnel junction like this, where you have a fixed layer, uh, you have a tunnel barrier, and a free layer that is, uh, uh, is free to switch uh, the magnetization from a parallel to anti-parallel configuration, recording a bit one or zero. And uh, this is done via a spin transit work. Uh, so this means that we drive the current through the pillar and the, the, uh, the current is polarized by the fixed layer, and then you can exert the torque on the free layer. Uh, but there are a few drawbacks there that the barrier uh, usually breaks, uh, is very sensitive, just a few, uh, few nanometer or less, or nanometer or less uh, thick. Uh, and the, and the, the current densities have to be very well controlled here, otherwise uh, you break down uh, this barrier. And uh, it's also not uh, super energy efficient, the better way uh, that is coming up is using spin orbit torque in which we separate the right line uh, here on the bottom uh, to the read line, which will be perpendicular here uh, to the device geometry. And in this way, uh, we can, for example, drive new current over here uh, by some uh, current to spin charge to spin conversion uh, mechanism. Then uh, we can assert a magnetic torque on the free layer uh, in contact to this, uh, to this uh, uh, spin over torque material. 
so for this, we need, in general, high spin orbit coupling. And uh, this should give us a very high uh, charge to spin conversion. One of the, the most common methods that uh, I think most of you are uh, familiar with is the so-called spin hole effect, which uh, if you drive a charge current density JC, uh, you can create a spin current density JS, which is perpendicular to both the charge current and the spin direction. So this means that if I drive a charge current from right to left on this uh, high spin orbit coupling material, I create a spin current uh, in the up direction with, uh, with the spin direction pointing in the plane. And this has an efficiency, uh, spin hole efficiency, uh, theta, which is usually for heavy metals, is usually in the order of 10%. And now, uh, well, 2D materials or layered materials are uh, these Van der Waals uh, stacked uh, materials that uh, I think you're also very familiar with. And it, it's a very large family. It started with graphene, a lot of people are studying that. Uh, later, uh, people start taking on the semiconductors uh, like molybdenum disulfite or tungsten diselenite, uh, and, and also uh, using boron nitride, which is a very nice insulator for encapsulation. Uh, but recently, uh, there, the, this family has been extended to all sorts of uh, different properties. So you have materials that are superconductors, semi-metals, topological insulators, so on and so forth. Uh, but the one thing that is really nice about it is that it, the large family of uh, layered materials gives us a, a variety of values for resistivity or band gap and, and crystal symmetries. They are very easy to, to exfoliate using uh, the scotch tape technique. Uh, and uh, this is perfect to do in the lab if uh, you're on a budget, because then you can just go and buy some scotch tape, you buy some single crystals, and you can easily do that in the lab for uh, a, hundred, a few hundred dollars. Um, they, uh, this exfoliation technique usually gives you uh, atomically flat and single crystals. Uh, they're, they're small, they're in the order of uh, 10 micrometers or so, but they are good enough to study single crystals uh, in the lab. And uh, a special part of these materials can offer you a very high spin orbit coupling, so they are very interesting for spintronics. But it's also good to, uh, to talk about what uh, layered materials cannot give you, or at least cannot give you yet. Uh, so several of these materials, uh, including all of the materials that I'm gonna talk about here in the talk, uh, they're air unstable, which means that if you exfoliate in air, that is, uh, the materials are gonna degrade. Now, uh, these materials are often not compatible with the uh, CMOS industry processes. Uh, they don't like sputtering uh, very much, so you can't sputter directly on top of them. Uh, it's, you have to control it that very well. Uh, it's very difficult to grow uh, in wafer scales, a uh, very uniform um, uh, layer. And uh, important here for the talk is also uh, single crystals in wafer scale of these materials are not available yet, uh, as far as I know. Now, uh, just a brief introduction to spin orbit torques, uh, what spin orbit torques are. Uh, so if you have a magnetization, so uh, we have a magnetization vector M over here, uh, and we have a magnetic field, this, um, uh, the magnetic moment wants to process around this field, right? This uh, gives a torque uh, which I call here field-like. Uh, but this uh, doesn't last forever. The magnetization is going to process and damp at the same time and go towards being aligned to the direction of the field. And uh, this means that I have a torque uh, that points uh, towards uh, the field, which is a damping-like field, a uh, damping-like torque. Uh, so if I put in vectorial form, uh, the field like is given by an M cross uh, sigma uh, torque, where sigma here is uh, X, Y, or Z. Uh, and uh, these torques that I call uh, field like uh, are odd in, in, uh, in M, in the magnetization direction. Now, uh, the damping-like torques, they, they are gonna be uh, even in M and uh, given by M cross, M cross sigma, where sigma here is X, Y, or Z. 
Now the measurement of spinobitorx, uh, so what we're interested here just to quantify the efficiency is the bottom part of the stack. So if you remove the, the top ferromagnetic layer, what you have is just uh, the spinobit material uh, in contact with a single ferromagnet. And then it can drive uh, with the ferromagnet with the magnetization in a certain direction. And then it can drive a current through it. This uh, has uh, Orsted fields associated to it, uh, which will cause a torque. Uh, if the magnetization is in the plane, this causes a torque pointing out of the plane uh, with an expression uh, M cross Y here. Uh, now, for example, if you have a spin hall effect, your spins are pointing, uh, let's say, to the right here in the direction of Y, uh, and they go and go uh, in the ferromagnet, and there's uh, the torque. Uh, this torque is going to be uh, parallel to the direction of the spins and parallel to the the, the plane, uh, and uh, this is a, a damping-like torque, m cross m cross Y, with uh, with an intensity uh, tau parallel. And this could be uh, due to spin hall effects, for example, or also some interfacial effects like Rush by Edelstein. Now, how do we measure this? Um, most techniques, most uh, electrical techniques, rely on the fact that uh, the resistance of your device or the resistance of the ferromagnetic layer is dependent on the angle that the magnetization uh, makes with the current. So, as we drive uh, as we drive a current, uh, because of the various torques that uh, will be acting on the magnetization, then uh, this uh, this uh, this angle is going to change between the magnetization and the current, and this changes uh, the resistance of uh, of the ferromagnetic layer. So, for example, AMR could uh, could be used to read it, or Planner Hall effect, or anomalous Hall effect. Um, one of the methods uh, that was developed uh, around 2000, early 2010 uh, is called spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. And uh, it, is, uh, it consists of a coplanar waveguide that we have a large here ground pad and we have a signal pad. We drive an RF uh, current through uh, with this uh, RF signal generator and we measure the voltage, uh, the DC voltage uh, as, uh, that uh, appears in a, in a resonance condition. So we apply magnetic fields, and because when the when the uh, when the frequency of this uh, RF uh, RF current matches with the Lamo precession frequency of the mag magnet, which is uh, right here, making the connection between the the ground pad and the signal pad then we have a resonance condition and this resonance condition appears in the voltage on the lock-in uh, like this. So if you have for a fixed frequency, RF frequency, and you scan the magnetic field, you get the resonance in your voltage. And uh, this uh, can be used to quantify, for example, just the, 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 the dynamic properties of your ferromagnet. So if you vary, uh, if you change the, the, the RF current frequency, uh, you can see that the resonance peak uh, moves in field, and uh, this can be described just by the Kittel equation, uh, and it's very uh, nicely uh, following it. But uh, there is one more important part, is that this, uh, this resonance shape over here, the line shape, can tell you a lot about it, uh, a lot about the torques that you have in your system. So if you have, for example, platinum bromoloy, and, uh, and you do uh, these type of experiments, you get uh, a line, a line uh, trace like this. You can decompose into a symmetric Lorentzian here in blue and an anti-symmetric Lorentzian here in red. And uh, these, you can describe this term, so the voltage, so that the amplitude uh, associated to the anti-symmetric Lorentzian is proportional to an out-of-plane torque which uh, is usually proportional to the Orsted fields in the system for uh, common platinum bromoloid, for example. Uh, and the symmetric uh, component will be proportional to the in-plane torques, which here, uh, for example, will be proportional to the spin hall effect. So if you just take the ratio of uh, Vs over Va, then uh, you have something that is proportional to the spin hall efficiency. So this is a very nice way to directly quantify uh, your spin hall efficiency in your device. Uh, 
Now, there is another way to do it, uh, to, to, to quantify the torques, which is uh, using uh, a non-resonant technique. It's, a, it's a using a, a second harmonic hall, which would drive a current uh, through a platinum bromoloid, for example, hall bar, uh, and you detect the, the hall voltage. Uh, so here is a, an example of an actual device. And uh, we rely on the fact that the voltage, the hall voltage, uh, depends on M. So you can see here, because of the planar Hall effect, as I vary uh, the angle uh, of my applied magnetic field with respect to the current, then I have uh, sinusoidal here, uh, a cosine uh, sine 2 phi uh, dependence. Now, if I apply uh, a current which varies in time, as for example, as uh, cosine omega t, and I detect the, the voltage, uh, if I have uh, a spin orbit torques there, what I will actually detect is a signal that looks like this, if I put in my oscilloscope, that has two components as a function of time. So it has a, a component that's uh, perfectly in phase, and it has the same uh, frequency, so uh, it's also cosine omega t. And I'll have a component that has twice the frequency, so it's in the second harmonic, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of my current. And uh, this uh, second harmonic voltage here to uh, V2 omega uh, can, uh, can be used to extract the torques. So if you have, uh, uh, you can uh, go through the whole derivation uh, and here uh, is the solution for it, that you have uh, two terms. Uh, the, uh, you, you actually, you, what, what you measure uh, is something like this as a function. So if you measure the second harmonic uh, hall as a function of the magnetization angle with respect to the current, this phi m, uh, you get a curve like that, which can be described by this, uh, these two terms, which here the first one uh, is proportional uh, to the out of plane field like torque. Uh, so it's uh, something that varies as cosine 2 phi, cosine phi. So it has this uh, blue dependence over here. Uh, and the second term here in red uh, has symmetry of uh, cosine phi, and it uh, behaves as an in-plane damping-like torque. Uh, so just by the symmetry or by fitting uh, the signal here on the, the second harmonic hall, we can extract uh, both, uh, both components at the same time. So we can separate by the periodicity. Now, uh, this has been used for uh, characterizing uh, devices com uh, composed of uh, molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide in connection with the ferromagnet, uh, cobalt iron boron. And uh, this was done in the Wayne group at UCLA. And what they see is basically they don't see any damping-like torque. Uh, this is in a monolayer MOS2 or WSE2. They only see uh, field-like torque. Uh, in the same year, almost at the same time, actually uh, slightly before, uh, the Hoffman group at Argonne uh, shown uh, in permaloy MOS2 uh, using STFMR now, uh, only a symmetric component, or mostly uh, composed of symmetric component, uh, which is proportional to the damping-like torque. So this, uh, this means that for the system, you only have a damping-like torque, which is uh, quite interesting that these two groups uh, get different uh, results, uh, qu uh, qualitative results uh, for uh, uh, an MOS2 attached to a ferromagnet, because uh, this uh, can mean uh, well different things. So this, uh, uh, either the techniques give different results, which I don't really uh, believe in, but uh, what it could be is that uh, one, in one case, we were uh, using MOS2 with permaloy, uh, which is nickel iron, and uh, King Wang group uh, was using uh, uh, MOS2 in contact with cobalt iron boron. And uh, these torques are uh, interfacial in nature, so it could very well be that uh, the different interfaces there give uh, qualitatively uh, different, uh, different torque symmetries. Uh, so this is, uh, this is very interesting, but uh, the theoreticians have to dig, uh, dig on further there to explain it uh, if that is really true. 
and what we were used, what we were interested uh, back then uh, in Cornell after these two papers uh, came uh, came through was uh, if we can use uh, single crystals to the materials like the ones uh, used by King Wang and uh, and uh, and Hoffman. Uh, to actually control the symmetries of the spin orbit work. So uh, with the, the symmetry of the material that we use actually uh, actually uh, imply or, uh, or, or uh, impose some, some of the symmetries onto the, the spin orbit works that we measure. Uh, so let's uh, start with a simple system. So platinum permaloy, uh, all, uh, both of them uh, are uh, non, uh, not the single crystal, so they, they are polycrystalline or amorphous. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, platinum permaloy, you have the current uh, applied in a certain direction here, uh, the direction of the electric field, and you have the magnetization pointing, let's say, at 40 degrees uh, with respect to this current. Uh, and you reverse the magnetization, so now you keep everything the same, but you just uh, reverse the magnetic field by 180. If you do an STFMR measurement, then uh, what you get is something like this. So if, if the voltage is a function of magnetic field, you basically get the same line shape uh, with, a, with a, an effect of minus one here that has to be uh, accounted for. Uh, but it's basically, they, they reproduce each other uh, exactly the same. But now, uh, if we try that on tungsten ditellurite, so if we have tungsten ditellurite permaloy and play the same trick, uh, so we apply the magnetic field in one direction and reverse it, now the line, uh, the line shape looks completely different. Uh, it, you can see here that with the magnetic field pointing uh, at the 40 degrees with the current direction, I have the, the line in red. Uh, and if I rotate the magnetic field by 180 degrees, uh, then I have the lining black. This is for the same frequency uh, of applied current, uh, same parameters, just the only thing that changes is the, the magnetic field. And uh, then uh, this torque actually can be described by a, a out of plane anti-damping torque uh, in the form of M cross M cross Z, uh, which is actually ideal for out of plane magnetic Sweet magnetization switching. So this uh, this torque actually is uh, the best torque or the most efficient torque to switch uh, a PMA material. Now uh, let's explore a little bit the, the symmetries of tungsten ditellurite. So if you look here, either from the top or uh, from the side, we have a few symmetry operations. So we have identity, which basically leaves the the crystal uh, the same. You have a mirror plane, uh, which is here along uh, the B-axis or uh, the BC plane. Uh, you have a glide mirror, uh, which is on the, the AC uh, plane with a translation in X and Z. And you have a screw axis, which is uh, a 180 rotation with a translation in X and Z. Uh, this gives us the space group uh, PMN21. But now, uh, if we uh, slap some uh, some permaloy on top of it uh, and uh, look at the uh, the symmetry is now uh, on this uh, on this system, then what we basically get is that we uh, remove everything that I that I had the translation in Z, and then I'm left with just the identity and the mirror plane, which is a much lower symmetry group uh, PM. So if we look at this, uh, this uh, anti-symmetric uh, component, which is the out-of-plane torque, uh, and look at the, uh, the, the, the amplitude as a function of uh, the magnetization uh, angle with the current, then what we get is uh, something asymmetric like this. Uh, and this can be uh, fit, uh, adding an additional anti-damping, uh, out-of-plane anti-damping torque to account for this a symmetry of 180 degrees uh, uh, rotation of the magnetization here. Um, and the, this, uh, we can explain that uh, this out of plane anti damping torque that we call tau b here uh, is pointing uh, in perpendicular to the plane here of the screen uh, and is linear in current. And the current, for example, here in this case, uh, would be uh, applied uh, parallel to this mirror plane. Now, if we apply this mirror plane, 
um, the current stays the same, uh, but the torque reverses sign. And the torque is a pseudo vector. This means that uh, the, the components parallel uh, to the, the, the mirror uh, have to reverse sign. Uh, but if this torque is linear in current, so this means that uh, uh, if I apply the current in one direction, I have to have a torque up. And if I reverse the current, I have to have torque down. Uh, and if I have this mirror plane over here, this just implies that by symmetry, this tau b has to be zero. But now what happens if I apply the current uh, perpendicular uh, to the mirror plane? Uh, if I apply uh, the, the mirror symmetry, now I reverse both the current uh, and the torque. So here, what the symmetry analysis tells you is that uh, tau b is in principle allowed, or it's uh, non-zero tau b is allowed. So to test this, uh, we actually went and uh, did uh, several devices with different uh, current orientations. So if you have here with the current parallel to the A axis and parallel to the A axis means perpendicular to this mirror plane, what we get is the curve that we had before, this uh, asymmetric curve due to the, the out of plane anti-damping torque. But now if you uh, have a device with a current perpendicular to the A axis, then we get the curve that uh, is much more symmetric uh, and uh, reproduces uh, what, uh, what we would expect from, for example, device platinum permalloy that doesn't have uh, this, uh, this unusual out of plane anti damping torque. And you can actually uh, do that as a function of the angle. So, from a current perpendicular to the mirror plane to a current parallel to the mirror plane, and uh, you quantify the strength of this torque as a function of the, the angle of the current in this mirror plane. And you can see that it nicely goes to zero when we go uh, with the current, uh, uh, with the current parallel to the mirror plane. Actually here it's uh, reversed uh, on top. Uh, there are also some uh, very nice uh, recent results of the, the Yang group in uh, Singapore uh, showing uh, nice and uh, strong spin orbit torques in uh, tungsten dichloride uh, that induce uh, magnetization, magnetization reversal as well. Uh, but uh, how does this uh, size up in, uh, in our devices? Uh, how does it compare to platinum? So platinum, uh, the, the damping torque, the anti-damping torque there, we can quantify by normalizing by the electric field. Uh, and what we have is something in the order of, uh, the, for the spin torque conductivity is something in the order of 10 to the fifth uh, per ohm per meter uh, in the uh, units of h bar over 2e. Uh, which means that this uh, has a, a spin orbit, uh, a spin torque efficiency uh, or spin hall efficiency uh, of uh, 10%. Now the tungsten dichloride, we have both this anti-damping torque, uh, which is about 10 to the fourth, so one order of magnitude lower than platinum. Uh, and uh, because of the resistivity is uh, actually also much uh, lower, it's also one order of magnitude uh, lower for the spin hall or uh, spin hall efficiency, so to say. Uh, this out of plane anti-damping torque is even smaller uh, now in the 0 0.4 10 to the fourth uh, in the spin torque uh, conductivity and in the order of 1% uh, in the, if I convert to a, to a spin hole angle, so to say. Uh, but okay, as tungsten dichloride is also uh, 100 times more resistive than platinum, uh, but it points us in the right direction that we can actually use these torques to, to do cool things. Uh, now, Let's move from tungsten dichloride, which is a low symmetry material and semi-metallic, into something that is, uh, has a higher symmetry, is hexagonal and metallic. Uh, and this material is niobium diselenide. It has also a higher spin orbit coupling, in addition to having the, the high conductivity. So uh, we can make, uh, we can play the same trick again. We can make STFMR devices in a niobium diselenide uh, permalloy uh, stack. And uh, even for a monolayer, we observe a very strong uh, STFMR signal. And uh, now if you reverse the, the, the field by 180 degrees, same thing that we did with, uh, with the tungsten dichloride, we had a, a little bit of a surprise uh, that they look different. Uh, the curves look different. 
uh, as they did for tungsten ditellurite, but for niobium diselenite, because of the high asymmetry, is in principle not allowed. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, we had to make a lot of devices uh, to to try to 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 get an indication what was uh, what was happening. So if you go from a monolayer into a bilayer uh, and do the same thing, while for the monolayer this difference uh, in the traces for uh, uh, the field applied in one direction and 180 degrees rotated uh, is very uh, very very different, uh, while for the bilayer they they look almost the same. Now you can, uh, you can quantify this better uh, by doing a full angular rotation uh, of the anti-symmetric and the symmetric component for the monolayer here on top and the bilayer device here on the bottom and uh, used to quantify uh, all the torques present there. Uh, you can also do that uh, for several thicknesses. So we did for uh, from a monolayer of selenite to a bilayer, four layers, and so on and so forth. And then we can plot a torque conductivity as a function of the niobium diselenite thickness for the different torques that we observe. So here is for the field-like torque, uh, uh, the out-of-plane field-like torque in the M cross Y uh, term. Uh, and uh, the data points here for each device, uh, each different device uh, are shown here. And we have uh, this uh, linear uh, uh, behavior over here, which is what we would expect from Orsted field. So just the current going through the niobium selenite. And the dashed, uh, the, the, the gray uh, part just is a standard deviation from uh, counting from all the errors uh, that we have in the experiment. And uh, here we can see that while the thicker flakes, they all seem to be dominated by an Orsted field, if I go to a very thin layer, so especially one and two layers, uh, they fall uh, much below our error margin. And actually, if you look here, the monolayer even points in the, the opposite direction of what we would expect uh, from, a, from an Orsted field. Uh, this is an indication uh, that uh, some uh, interfacial torque might be playing a role. This is not a confirmation because there are other things that can also account for, for this. But now uh, let's go to the anti-damping-like torque, which is kind of a spin hole like uh, And here we do the same thing. So the torque conductivity as a function of uh, niobium selenide thickness. And you can see here that it's more or less constant if you uh, if you believe uh, these data points, it looks that perhaps is increasing, uh, which is what you would expect from a, from a spin hole effect. Uh, but here, uh, again, for the monolayer and the bilayer, which should, is, are basically uh, interfacial devices, we have a very sizable uh, spin orbit torque. And uh, these guys are uh, an, a strong indication that we have interfacial torques uh, playing a role there uh, as well. Now, uh, what happens to that uh, weird uh, uh, torque? It's an in-plane field-like torque, uh, time m cross z, uh, which is, as a function of the niobium diselenide thickness, is all over the place. Basically, uh, sometimes it points uh, in one direction, uh, it has a certain intensity, sometimes it points in another direction, has a much different uh, intensity. Uh, and if you do a symmetry analysis, as I told you before, uh, these torques are not allowed because basically we have the C3 symmetry here, uh, the threefold rotation in this crystal, and uh, this would kill uh, any torque uh, with this symmetry. But uh, now we could allow for a little bit of a strain created by the permalloy. And in this case, this torque is actually allowed by symmetry. Uh, so the, we don't control uh, the strain here in our devices, but you can imagine that if you uh, make a device, for example, on top of, uh, of a piezoelectric, or if you can control the strain in your stack in some way, uh, then you would be able to control these torques. And I have to say that it's not only this uh, in-plane field-like torque that is allowed, uh, it's also the out-of-plane anti-damping torque that we saw for the nitelluride, although we don't see it uh, for the for the niobium diselenide, we are not sure why yet. Now, finally, I will come to the last material, which are more uh, recent results uh, that we recently posted on archive. Uh, and 
uh, it, we were we used an insulating antiferromagnet, which is a nickel thiophosphate, so NIPS3. And uh, this is, comes from a class of materials uh, that, ha that, that have a very large uh, uh, band gap or very large, I mean, uh, in the above 1 EV. Uh, and uh, they're a little bit air unstable. It's not so bad as niobium diselenite or tungsten ditellurite. Um, and they have uh, the, the neo temperature or the transition, uh, the antiferromagnetic transition temperature uh, in the order of hundreds of Kelvin. Uh, so this uh, makes it easy to do uh, temperature dependent uh, measurements to see the effect of a magnetization on the, on the torques. Now, uh, for all purposes here, uh, uh, nickel thiophosphate is an antiferromagnetic insulator uh, because we attach it uh, to permalloy, which is a very good metal. Uh, so basically, our current goes all through the permalloy. Uh, for nickel thiophosphate, we have near neo temperature at 170 Kelvin in bulk. Uh, and we are going to use second harmonic hall uh, measurements to quantify the torque with a plat uh, permalloy thickness in the order of six nanometers. Now we can. Uh, do uh, it can measure the the whole voltage in the first harmonic and the second harmonic as a function of uh, the the magnetic field angle, and you get this uh, this beautiful uh, sinusoidal behavior uh, here for uh, for the the first harmonic, which is a clear indication of a planar hole uh, effect, and uh, we do get a, a decent signal here uh, for the second harmonic uh, hall that we can decompose into a, uh, a uh, cosine uh, phi and a cosine two phi cosine phi dependence. Uh, that, as I told you before, uh, the cosine two phi cosine phi would be something uh, that is uh, proportional to the field light torque, and the cosine phi term would be something that is proportional to the damping light torque. Uh, now, it can do that uh, for different magnetic fields. So you increase the magnetic field and do the same measurement uh, for a fixed temperature. But you can also do uh, the same thing for uh, the various uh, temperatures to get the temperature dependence. And uh, for, each, uh, for each temperature, uh, we have to vary uh, the magnetic fields and extract these two constants. So the, 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 the one that would be proportional to the field like and the one that's proportional to the damping like torque, just to exclude any, for example, thermal effects that would uh, be in a constant term, while the torque term that we are interested in is uh, proportional to uh, one over the magnetic field that we apply. So we basically measure uh, for a fixed temperature uh, several curves with a varying magnetic field. We extract these two constants, uh, CFL and CDL, and we fit with uh, with uh, one over magnetic field, the one over magnetic field plus uh, the anisotropy term. Uh, now, uh, this uh, summarizes the results for uh, two uh, nickel thiophosphate samples, nickel thiophosphate permaloy samples, compared to a sample of platinum permaloy. Uh, so this is the damping-like torque normalized by the electric field. So this is the, the, the spin torque conductivity as a function of temperature. And as you can see here for the platinum permalloy uh, here in this, uh, the green stars, this is more or less constant. Uh, while for the nickel thiophosphate, uh, depending on the device, so here uh, there is a little bit of device dependence, uh, you can see that uh, for one of our devices that we call device one, uh, there is a little bit of variation on the torque, but not much. Uh, while for device two, there is uh, this sudden uh, shoot up here to values that even go well above uh, the torques that we, uh, we measure with the conventional platinum permalloy uh, devices here at low temperatures. Uh, and the, this sample to sample variation indicates that interface transparency in our devices uh, can be playing a role there. Now we also uh, see uh, uh, a very large, uh, or a very large from what you would expect, uh, field light torque for a few of our devices. Uh, 
And here, while platinum was, again, more or less constant, it increases a little bit because the resistivity of platinum goes down uh, with temperature. Uh, for the nickel thiophosphate permalloy uh, devices, sometimes actually we measure a positive torque, sometimes we measure a negative torque, and both of them are uh, dependent uh, with temperature. So they start very close to zero at room temperature and increase in size as we uh, go down. And here the needle transition temperature is around 150, 170 for bulk uh, for this, uh, these crystals that we measure. Now, uh, we were actually interested in the beginning to see if there was any symmetry dependency uh, on the torques uh, due to the, the break of symmetry due to the magnetic ordering in these devices. So if you have the, the crystal at room temperature, uh, the bulk crystal is, uh, has space group C2 slash M, while the monolayer is D3H. But when we cool down, we get uh, this uh, magnetic ordering. With the, it's a uh, antiferromagnetic in the zigzag uh, ordering. And uh, this breaks several symmetries of the crystal. And we are left basically with uh, just a single mirror plane uh, passing here from the top to bottom, basically. Uh, this reduces to the PM group, which is the same as the, the tungsten ditellurite or uh, the CS for the monolayer. Now to test this, uh, we did uh, just a very simple measurements in the whole bar, uh, flowing the current in one direction and measuring the whole voltage uh, uh, perpendicular to it. Uh, for the, let's say here, the field like to work as a function of temperature and uh, we get a certain dependency. And now if you uh, apply the current uh, in the, the other direction, rotated by 90 degrees uh, and measure the voltage uh, perpendicular to it, uh, we measure a very small difference. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, just, just a few percent. Uh, this difference uh, here uh, is slightly larger uh, for the anti-damping torque uh, for, for our devices, but it's still uh, within a factor of two. And it doesn't have uh, much of, uh, the temperature dependence is pretty much the same for both of them. So this indicates that it's probably not there. Uh, probably these, uh, uh, the symmetry dependent torques are not, uh, at least not affected by uh, the magnetization of the system. Uh, and we also, we don't see any evidence of the other torque symmetries, uh, namely the, the out of plane, uh, the out-of-plane anti-damping torque, M cross M cross Z, or the in-plane fields like torque, M cross C, that we observed in the other systems. So just to summarize uh, what we have, so if I have here the spin orbit torque uh, symmetry, so out-of-plane field-like, which is kind of worsted field-like torque, uh, the in-plane anti-damping, which is spin hole like torque, then I have the out-of-plane anti-damping and the in-plane field-like torque. Uh, for platinum, uh, I have the first two, uh, they are allowed and I, I observe them, uh, while the bottom two are not allowed by symmetry and we do not uh, see them. Now in the tungsten ditellurite, uh, uh, all these torques are allowed by symmetry, but we do not observe the in-plane field-like torque. In niobium diselenite, is, uh, in strained niobium diselenite, I have to say, is, uh, uh, is exactly the opposite. Uh, that we do observe the in-plane field-like torque, but we do not observe the out-of-plane anti-damping torque. And uh, for nickel thiophosphate below the new transition temperature, while all these torques would be in principle allowed if I take the magnetization uh, ordering, the magnetic ordering into account, uh, we only observe the conventional uh, out-of-plane field-like or the in-plane anti-damping-like torques. And uh, the conclusion here is that we need to get a better understanding of what's going on uh, in these materials. And uh, there has been a, a very nice uptake by the, the theoretical community. Uh, it's a, now it's a very strong push to understand uh, what's going on in these materials. With that, I would like to thank again my collaborators and I thank you and welcome any questions. Thank you very much for the for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so this uh, talk is open for questions. If you are uh, in Zoom, please use the 
participants list and uh, use the raise hand option to uh, if you want to ask a question. If you're on Twitch, please just uh, type your question in the in the chat box, and I will read it for you. Uh, let me ask the uh, first question. Um, on slide 47, uh, 43, um, you were just uh, uh, showing the, uh, the, the differences in the, in the talks when you apply current in the different directions. A factor of two for the anti-damping like torque is still very large. And uh, um, uh, you, you, you also say that uh, the two have the similar temperature dependence, which kind of indicates it may not be difference may not be real, but um, if th there is this kind of um, the anisotropy in the anti-damping like torque, uh, what do you expect the temperature dependence would be? Wh why would that be different? So what uh, I have to do, uh, there is a, a caveat here uh, on the on the argument that I'm going to say, but the, what we would expect uh, is that uh, we would see a, a sudden change in the, the ratio, let's say, uh, or the, the, the factor between the, the two current directions, uh, sudden change uh, as we cross the neo temperature, uh, which would be an indication of that the magnetization, uh, yeah, the magnetic ordering is doing something. However, I have to say that this material, uh, you can even observe some uh, local magnetic ordering uh, even at room temperature. And uh, this uh, can be shown, for example, by the, the, the magnum peak, uh, the two magnum peak at room temperature in Raman, it uh, is, still, uh, is still there uh, even at room temperature. So you can have some, uh, some local magnetic ordering, which might be playing a role or might not, um, but uh, I, I would still expect that it would be uh, uh, a sudden uh, increase uh, in the ratio over here. Uh, and uh, there, uh, the thing is, there uh, there are many other things that could uh, could affect these measurements. Uh, that the current path, uh, for some reason, is different. Uh, that our device is not completely homogeneous. So since we don't have uh, this, uh, yeah, smoking gun proof here uh, uh, that this is the case, then uh, I'd rather not uh, push for it. I see. Thank you. Do you have other questions? Uh, let me ask another another question for, oh, there's one question. Uh, Mahendra, please go ahead and uh, unmute and ask a question. Mahendra, you have to um, unmute yourself. Hi, uh, now I can unmute. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, Marcus, very nice talk. Uh, I have a Thank question on, um, on the um, uh, uh, spin orbit torque from the antiferromagnetic insulator. Yeah. Um, since nickel, phosphorus, and sulfur, right? Those three yeah. elements uh, do not have a strong spin orbit coupling, but uh, the results here, um, the spin orbit torque seems to be large. Uh, what is the reason behind it? Uh, well, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there are some things that uh, can cause uh, uh, this, uh, this strong uh, spin orbit torque. One of them is uh, if by whatever reason we have non-collinear magnetization, even in the permaloy itself uh, at the, the interface, uh, we can cause actually very strong torques. This, uh, this uh, has been shown also before. Uh, so this can be an indication of that. Uh, and uh, this might account that for a few of our devices, we, we see a stronger 
uh, temperature dependence like this, uh, as opposed to, to this one. And uh, this means that uh, depending on the interface transparency for interfaces, uh, the spin transparency is uh, very good. So we have a, a strong uh, spin scattering at the interface, uh, which is, uh, and for one sample we do not, or that uh, for one sample is more temperature dependent, uh, then that's, that can explain the different uh, behaviors for both samples. Uh, but uh, we, again, we don't know for sure. We are doing more experiments now uh, to confirm uh, these uh, these torques, well, the behavior of these torques, and see if we can do uh, a better job there in the sample prep to get more consistent results. I see. So um, I have one more question. So um, how does the resistivity as a function of uh, temperature uh, versus this uh, spin conductivity compare? Does the spin conductivity follow resistivity versus temperature pattern? No, so the resistivity here is dominated by, by permaloy. And uh, uh, I think I didn't show here, uh, but, the, but the resistivity is basically, uh, is basically flat or slightly decreasing as a function of temperature. And uh, we can show that uh, by uh, just uh, simple measurements, uh, comparison with the devices of uh, just permaloy, that uh, this is basically just, uh, just the permaloy resistivity. So the conductance, these torques are uh, purely interfacial in nature. Um, so, so there are uh, previous reports, uh, if it is perfectly um, interfacial, then we would expect to see more feel-like torque, right? But here yeah, we are seeing uh, more damping-like torque. So that is how true. do we understand uh, this? But, the, but again, it, uh, it depends uh, if you have uh, uh, which type of uh, spin scattering or if you have uh, scattering at the interface, uh, if you have a, a momentum scattering and spin scattering at the interface or not. Uh, and this can affect the, the type of torque that we see. Yeah, I see. Um, thank you. All right, um, actually, I saw David, David Smith, do you still have a question? Uh, I do, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, earlier you mentioned that you couldn't make these 2D, uh, 2D materials using a technique like sputtering. So what do you use to go about making these 2D materials? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we can't do it. Uh, uh, I'm saying that you have to be uh, careful there uh, to not get alloying or to not uh, destroy your material. So you you can't uh, use the same parameters as you would deposit uh, on top of flattening, for example. Um, so what we actually do that we found that was very gentle, and uh, we have uh, cross-sectional TM images uh, to show, uh, uh, is an off-axis uh, sputtering, which the, the, uh, our gun makes an 85 degree angle with respect to the normal uh, sample normal. So it's really, really grazing incidence. And uh, there we could see uh, during the cross-sectional TEM that uh, even the top layer maintains the crystallinity uh, really well in our materials. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, Kirill, um, please go ahead and ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, I, I had a question about this angular dependence when you um, when you discussed uh, niobium diselenide and this M cross Z term. So um, a first question: So does this take into account the whole azimuthal dependence with the with the magnetization going around full circle in the plane, or is it just some sector of that? So no, it, it does uh, it does take into account uh, that. So we have um, where is it here? Uh, this is basically that. That's uh, that's phi. Uh, that's the in-plane angle uh, phi. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there we can see that the torque always points in the direction of phi. Uh, so increasing phi. Okay. Uh, we can't. Uh, really uh, do the measurements as a function of theta, uh, at, at least mm -hmm. in that setup. Uh, so ideally, would also like to to do a, 
a dependence in the in the uh, with the, the, the yeah. angle with the z-axis, uh, but this is just in the phi dependence. Right. So uh, one thing that looks strange to me, it, it seems to me that the symmetry plane should destroy that term. Um, even if you do that strain that you showed, you still have the um, uh, symmetry plane that goes like this, and I think it forbids this term. It depends on, I think it would depend on where, uh, which direction you're applying the current, but I think... Uh, No, and but it depends on once you wrote m cross z, uh, you can assume the following. Yeah, no, that that is, uh, yeah, that's true. So you have to have uh, uh, something that is trained. Uh, yeah, in a, no. I'm just on, wondering that on uh, unit direction away. If if you start writing these terms and the angular dependence, so there is a bunch of different terms that that are allowed even in the fully isotropic case so for example you can you can always have a term that goes like m cross z times m dot e mm -hmm. it always exists right there, you don't need any symmetry um, breaking at all for that now if you look at a particular symmetry group um, for a crystallographic group you would have additional terms that would not look like vector products and scalar products that would involve some higher order tensors, right? And um, um, they can contain in plane terms. So I was wondering if you if you uh, tried uh, looking at um, at the full set of terms allowed for the given symmetry group and see if maybe you can fit to some of those rather than the simple m cross z. That that is a good suggestion. Um, that's a good suggestion. We did we haven't tried that. Mm -hmm. Okay, because in general, I mean, there is a method based on vector spherical harmonics, for example, mm -hmm. where you can identify which ones are allowed in the given um, symmetry and just um, see if it fits to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, is there any other question here? Okay, if there's uh, no other question, I want to thank the uh, speaker again, and I want to thank all of you for participating.